Aloha, this is Hamza Rifa Dosan. You're watching Islamabad today for Think Tech Hawaii. Today's topic is climate change in South Asia. When we talk about South Asia, it's an extremely strategically important region. Uh, it, has, it is a region which is extremely dynamic. There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of socioeconomic challenges. And amid all of this, climate change also presents a significant amount of challenges to try and you know, overcome, to try and make sure that South Asia and its future generations can actually be taken into consideration as far as sustainability is concerned. I am joined by, and I'm lucky enough to have with me, Ms. Aisha Khan. She's the executive director of the Civil Society Coalition for Climate Change. And she's also the chief executive officer of Mountain and Glacier Organization. Ms. Aisha Khan, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Pleasure to be with you. Well, Ms. Aisha Khan, let's start off with climate change in South Asia. How significant of it uh, is it, you know, when you talk about it, as a challenge, when you talk about, uh, there's this view that unless there's a concerted effort worldwide to cut greenhouse gas emissions, South Asia will suffer huge economic, social, and environmental damage from the consequences of climate change. Um, I'm not going to ask you whether there's any truth to it. There must be some truth to it. But how significant of a problem is climate change in this region? I think climate change is a significant problem globally, but when we narrow it down to this region, I think it is a huge challenge because South Asia is warming up more rapidly than the rest of the world. And within South Asia, Pakistan is warming up more rapidly. So we need to take a very holistic and integrated view because South Asia is a subcontinent and its geography and its topography is highly varied. So when you look at countries with high mountains, you also have countries with long coastlines, you have deserts, you have, you know, so much geography over here where temperature extremes can rise up to 50 degrees Celsius and they can be minus 50 degrees Celsius as well. So when you're looking at that region, uh, you have a, a potential for conflict over here because as climate warms up, a lot of things are going to start happening. A lot of sectors are going to get affected. We have, of course, you know, the nexus between food, water, energy. We also have uh, recurring disasters and we have a lot of people who rely on these uh, ecological goods and services whose lives will get disrupted, whose livelihoods will get disturbed. And uh, I think one example loud and clear is the recent floods in Pakistan. We've seen what that has done to the economy of the country, to the um, poverty levels which have gone further deep and uh, the way it has altered the social and the economic dynamics. So if you take that to scale and you see these things happening in every country in South Asia, you're looking at a very, very dangerous situation. Yeah, well, absolutely. And it, it can actually become dire as well. So Ms. Aisha, a warming trend of about you know 0 0.75 degrees Celsius has been observed in annual mean temperatures in South Asia over the past century. This trend is absolutely consistent. What do you think are the measures that South Asian economies can actually adopt to try and make sure that increase in temperatures can actually be averted? Countries can work um, at, at the country level as well. But I think when you're talking about climate change, just as we need a multilateral agreement and arrangements to arrive at mitigation and adaptation measures, I think the same applies to South Asia as the region, because we are connected by air, we are connected by land, we are connected by water, we share a common ecology. So unless we start working together, it will be very difficult for any one country to address its problems. And I say that with water in mind. We all derive our water from the same source, the Himalaya, Hindu Kush, Karakoram mountain ranges. This is also the third pole. So any hydrological imbalances and changes that take place in this region are not going to remain confined to this region. They'll have a rippling effect on the economy, on of South Asia, and they will also disturb and disrupt the global planetary regime. So I think that the way forward lies in cooperation. Unfortunately, we do have dysfunctional relationship between countries in the region. We do have political tensions in the region, and we need to bypass that. We need to somehow find a way to decouple politics from the other uh, climate change uh, related uh, aspects where cooperation is possible and move towards geo-cooperation uh, in, the, in the region and uh, geo-economic 
incentives in the region, which can provide uh, livelihoods, which can provide um, opportunities for sharing information, because what happens uh, at the higher altitudes affects countries uh, or regions downstream. So all these issues are interconnected and uh, most of the economies are reliant on uh, agriculture. We also share social similarities. Um, we have the same issues with poverty, with a youth bulge, with a gender not having enough representation in decision making. So when you look at that, learning and cross-pollination of ideas and creating knowledge hubs where we can learn from each other, because each country does have a way of addressing its challenges and constraints and convert all of that into an opportunity for the region. All right. So, but when you talk about resolving disputes and decoupling politics from climate change, obviously India and Pakistan, especially with the Modi-led BJP government in New Delhi and the fact that, you know, even the Pakistani establishment along with the democratic government, they don't seem to be seeing eye to eye on many issues. So do you think climate change or collaboration on climate change would, you know, inevitably suffer? And that would lead to, you know, smaller countries like the Maldives and Sri Lanka suffering from possible inundation. I'm an optimist, so I'd like to think that climate change will probably push us towards cooperation and collaboration because each country stands to lose. The dividends of collaboration are many and the perils of not cooperating and disruptions and destabilization will be bad for every economy because one thing happening in one part will affect other regions. Let me just mention out migration, for example, when you have large numbers of people who are living in climate hotspots. And there was uh, a few years ago, a report by the World Bank that says nearly 800 million people living in South Asia will be in climate hotspots. Essentially, what that means is that survivability in these areas will become very difficult. So uh, people will move out. That means dis, uh, disruption in livelihoods. That means displacement. That also means a burden on the host communities. So this will trigger societal strife and this will also trigger violent conflict um, due to uh, resource uh, scarcity. So I think that we need to have policies for how to deal with climate refugees within the country and out migration because, you know, I mean, we have um, on our eastern border in India and we have Afghanistan where we are seeing extreme poverty. We've already hosted a lot of refugees due to political considerations earlier. And now we're going to see a climate change or climate induced refugees coming in. So how much burden can one country absorb? Um, I think if we look at it collectively and we understand that we have to look ourselves as one South Asia, and we have to look at the absorptive capacity, the adaptive capacity, and the transformative potential for South Asia. We will be able to move forward because I personally am convinced that we need to take an intergenerational perspective that spans across political planning and financial systems. That is the only way forward. And I think leadership sooner or later will also come to realize that because I think green voting, if that becomes a trend, will also drive political parties to adopt manifestos that provide them with a resilient future. And uh, anybody who looks long-term will understand that resilience is something for which you have to work together. You have to look at all the different factors that contribute to making a people, a society, a country resilient, and you have to do that together. And I always come back to water because I feel that getting water from the same source is a, a common agenda for everyone. We, we, we have monsoon rains also, but you know, over that we really don't have any control. But being upper and lower riparian, and every country in South Asia is either an upper or lower oh, riparian. Yeah. So we have to take those factors into account and we have to see how do we promote hydro solidarity? How do we work and move towards climate diplomacy? And how can we overcome the differences to forge a future that will be good for the people and that will bring shared prosperity to everyone. Because at the end of the day, this is a question of human security. And then it becomes a question of national security. So if you don't address it um, on time and you see the storm coming and you wait for it to hit you, maybe it's too late. Yeah, but and that, that is what... Adam
it means. I think, you know, we usually think of adaptation in terms of building resilient infrastructure, but it, I think adaptation also means reconciling with the emerging geopolitical realities and changing uh, and shifting from past ways of doing things because the business as usual is not an option anymore. So we have to adopt new strategies but for, the, for, for engagement. Yeah, absolutely, for engagement. But, you know, when you talk about preemptive strategies, obviously the role of legislation cannot be sidestepped either. I mean, what we've noticed in India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka is the fact that even Bangladesh, for that matter, there's very little talk about climate change. I mean, legislation, which is actually passed, it's more concerned about you know, targeting your political opponents or trying to, you know, uh, adopt cosmetic measures to try and tackle money laundering for that matter. Where Where is legislation in South Asia? Because without domestic legislation, you cannot really operationalize the strategies that you just mentioned. I think more than that, the legislation, what we need here is national adaptation plans, which is part of the nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. And I wouldn't quite agree that uh, the countries in South Asia are not paying ample political attention or social attention or media attention to climate change. I've been working in this sector for over 20 years. And in the last seven, eight years, I have seen this subject shift from the periphery to center stage in all the countries of the world and also in South Asia. India is doing a lot of things to shift to uh, renewable energy. Pakistan also has developed its um, uh, NDC and submitted that, and it's in the process of developing its adaptation plan. So that provides you with the roadmap. And each country does have a climate change policy that provides you with the goals and targets and ambitions that you're setting for yourself for mitigation and for adaptation. So I think countries are doing what they can within their capacities and capabilities. What we lack mostly in South Asia is resources. We lack technology and we lack capacity. And I think that, you know, if we start working together, we can work towards our energy security. We can work towards our water security. And if we work as a block, as a region, and we go into these international conferences also, our voice will be heard. It will matter more uh, as, as a block, as, as one South Asia, rather than as individual countries. For that, SARC needs to, you know, take center stage or because we're talking about uh, regional solutions, they have to be indigenous solutions. So when you talk about a regional block, I mean, there will be many, uh, you know, scholars and experts and practitioners who would argue that that would be more of an idealistic sort of scenario. Would you agree to that? I think that, you know, under the present circumstances, it may appear to be unrealistic to think of peace and stability and prosperity in the region. But we have to plot for a future trajectory. And I think within each country, that's the role that civil society plays, that it, it uh, becomes an enabler. It starts demanding peace and security and prosperity. And it is possible. I think, you know, in Pakistan, we have demonstrated that under the new national security uh, plan that came up, that we will focus on geoeconomics. So I think political agendas uh, change. And we have to understand that the focus of electoral governments is also short-lived. It, it runs through its electoral cycle. And a lot of what they do is to try and mm, do things that will get them more traction from the voter. But I think long-term, climate change should be made into like a compact, which is uh, across borders and generations, because that's a common agenda that we need to follow as a global common good. And uh, I think with enough disasters happening and with economies suffering, uh, we will see perhaps, I'm quite hopeful that we will see a shift. There is, uh, um, uh, I think, um, a desire a desire for a growth, for development. And that cannot happen when you have the region in constant turmoil. So I think that in itself perhaps will drive us towards uh, peace uh, over conflict. So when we talk about the role of in international institutions, for example, the United Nations for that matter, when we talk about climate change bodies. Um, do you think that there's, you know, you could say disproportionate attention being played on climate change as far as the Western world is concerned, and you know, we talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, we talk about South Asia, we talk about other impoverished regions who are who tend to be neglected. Do you think that is also a problem as far as ensuring that you know a trickle-down effect on the local population in these regions can actually materialize as far as 
climate change mitigation is concerned? I think that's an agenda also that has been moving faster than it did in the last 30 years. From 1992 up to 2015, for example, there was very slow progress. There was no cooperation. There was no agreement. Now, after the Paris Agreement, we have at least an agenda of solutions. So 196 countries agreed there that, yes, this is human cost and it needs solutions that need to be found through a common strategy. So the the progress that we're making is still very slow because the global north responsible for the historic emissions hasn't taken the responsibility to mitigate at the speed that it needs to do. Perhaps it's waiting for more technology to come in and address the issue. And meanwhile, they're not too stressed out about it because they have the economies, they have the resources, they have the technology to address their problems. But countries like ours, developing economies, the small nation states, they are going to suffer. And that is why at these uh, conference of parties that take place in the last few conference of parties or COPs as they are known, you must have noticed that the pitch or the demand for climate justice has gone up because yeah. people are suffering. And, and the Pakistan government- was one of the few countries that has been championing uh, this entire agenda. It has. It has. And, uh, and I think that, you know, we are caught, uh, um, uh, along with other countries, into a recovery trap. We've hardly recovered from one disaster before another one hits us. And it needn't always be hydrometeorological disasters. It can be a drought. It can be a failure of crops. It can be hot spots. It can be anything that disrupts livelihoods. So we are facing that every year from 2010 onwards, I think, we have suffered losses to the tune of 3.8 billion annually. So, so th th that is a huge amount. And in the last floods, about 9 million people were displaced and about 7.6 million are still facing severe problems of food security. Um, the estimates that were uh, made by the World Bank of loss, damage, recovery stand at 30 billion. So we find that, you know, it's very difficult for us um, to cope with the challenges and the constraints. And under a pessimistic scenario, I think the, the likelihood of uh, the GDP falling by 10 to 13% by 2050 has also been highlighted by the World Bank in one of its reports. And uh, I think uh, the poverty rate will also drop by 8.4%. So, uh, or increase by 8.4%. 8 yeah, it would increase. So have, right? Yeah, th that's under a pessimistic scenario. But right now, Everything looks very pessimistic to us because the disasters are happening. Our coping capabilities are, are not robust. And therefore, I think with every year, the disaster becomes exponential and our coping capacity also declines exponentially as a result of that. So I think that, you know, as, as a country, we are very concerned. And I do see as civil society actor more concern uh, in policy circles about addressing the issue. It's true that because people always find um, the topics of politics and economics more interesting, the mainstream media prime time is talking more about political instability political. and the drama associated with political statements, and they're not giving the space to climate change that it deserves. And I think that is something that needs to definitely change. All right. So when we talk about, um, you know, a few statistics, as you rightly mentioned, uh, without global action on climate change, temperatures may rise by 4.6 degrees Celsius. And we talk about the collective economy of six countries. We're talking about Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Pakistan. They could shrink up to 1.8% every year by 2050. And more alarmingly, it's going to be till about 8.8% by uh, 2100 on average. So what we're talking about at this point in time is you have economies which are already shrinking. We have Sri Lanka, which has just witnessed a bankruptcy crisis. We have Pakistan, which is on the verge of, you know, possible default, even though the government, uh, you know, contradicts that. India is doing quite well, but, you know, there's rising income inequality. So South Asia can't really bear the brunt of, you know, such GDP contractions, can it? No, it, it, it cannot. And, you know, there is a counter argument to say that the existing gaps and the vulnerabilities are due to poor policy or weak institutional mechanisms. So while that may be true, and I do acknowledge because as civil society, we often flag those issues, but 
climate change is a threat multiplier. If we didn't have climate change, perhaps, you know, um, civilization has evolved. The West also went through the period that we are going through and it gradually evolved into the developed economies. So without climate change, perhaps in our own time in the next 10 or 15 years, we would have also stumbled and found our way forward. Excuse me. That's all right. <laughs> but climate change doesn't afford us the luxury of time anymore. And that is why I say that this is disproportionate, it is unequal burden sharing, and it is pulling us down. Well, Saisha Khan, finally, if you were to give five recommendations to South Asian economies, obviously they do vary in terms of their economic growth, and your political systems also vary to a significant extent, <laughs> but you do have political instability, you have lots of factors which are very similar. So in light of this, what would your five recommendations be for the South Asian governments as far as mitigating climate change? I think, uh, yeah, I, I would just say that, you know, they should look at the long term human security of the region and they should look at the past and see how they need to change and adapt for the future. And I think trade, tourism, transit, these are clear cut direct opportunities for us to engage where we will suddenly start seeing more economic prosperity because at the end of the day, what you need to do is to provide economic resilience for the common man, his own bounce back capacity. And that cannot be ensured if you have the, the data that you just shared with me about poverty, the spiraling poverty. So you need to frame vulnerability, I think, in ways where you are looking at what does it feel like, not just economic losses, but intergenerational losses. What does it feel like to rob someone of their human dignity, of condemning the future generations to a lifelong sentence of poverty? of depriving and taking away the hope of future generation of being able to realize their full human potential. So I think we should frame it that way and look at human security and shared prosperity. And uh, it's just a question of how you frame and um, through which lens do you look at your future. So if you look at a future through collective and shared prosperity, I think many windows will open. Sasha Khan, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. So that's all that we have for now. Um, you can follow our show on social media and you can give us our feedback as well. That's it for me, Hamza Rafat Hussain. You're watching Islamabad today on Tech Tech Hawaii. Take care. Until next time. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.